Do you ever feel pressed down, pressed down by life, pressed down, overwhelmed by the responsibilities at work or the obligations at home? Do you ever feel pressed down, feeling like you have to be everything to everyone all the time, every single day? Do you ever feel overwhelmed by death, by the death of of a loved one, or by the loss of something precious to you, or a transition that you're going through, and you're going through it kicking and screaming? Do you ever feel overwhelmed by the thoughts in your head that are like in this endless loop? Maybe you're ruminating about something someone did or said, or maybe it's something you did or you said, and you just can't let it go. Well, if you're anything like me, that's precisely the moment you need to get outside. To get into the out of doors. To hit the pause button, to look around. To see and to hear and to experience. To reconnect with the natural world, which is its own form of healing, even salvation. It's in moments like this where you need to watch a tree be a tree and a bird be a bird and a squirrel be a squirrel and a sky be the sky, be what it is. And to remember that you didn't create this. You're not the center of this. And you're not separated at all from any of it. It's a part of you and you are a part of it. In those moments, I remember the words of the poet Wendell Berry who said, when, I, when despair for the world grows in me and I wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in the beauty of the water and where the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water, and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light. For a time, I rest in the grace of the world and am free. Or I think of the poet Mary Oliver who wrote, Tell me about despair, yours, and I will tell you about mine. Meanwhile, meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes, over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese high in the clean blue air are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination calls to you like the wild geese harsh and exciting over and over again announcing your place in the family of things your place in the family of things somewhere along the way we were persuaded that God preferred four walls and a roof to wide open spaces Somewhere along the way, we bought into the idea that God was chiefly interested in religion. Somewhere along the way, we started to believe that God's only home was the church, or rather the church building. Somewhere along the way, we were taught that God's only sacred book was the Bible. Somewhere along the way, we stopped seeing what is abundantly clear. And many of us felt like we had to make a choice between the sanctuary and the garden. Even though the sacred book begins in a garden and ends in a garden, we had to make a choice, we thought. Some of us thought we had to make a choice between the Lord's prayer and still water, even though the prayer leads us to the still water. Somewhere along the way, we thought we had to make a choice between the Sermon on the Mount and the wild geese, even though Jesus' teachings are pretty darn wild. But here's the good news. We don't have to make that choice. We really don't have to choose between the sanctuary 
in the garden. Let me tell you about the Celtic Christians. These are the Christians in Scotland and Ireland who thrived, survived just beyond the grip of the Roman Empire. Just beyond the grip of institutional religion. They did not have the conquering energy of the Romans. They were Christian, but they respected the traditions that came before them. And they found ways of beginning a dialogue, finding points of connection and integration with those who came before, and their theology moved in some beautiful ways, very differently than the theology of the institution and the empire. They believed in the sacred book of the Bible. But they also believed there was a book that preceded the Bible that was equally sacred. And that was this book, the book of creation. The book of creation. And they taught one another to study this book, to pay attention to this book, to learn what this book had to teach. And when they heard Paul, the Apostle Paul, written in the letters, talk about Christ as the firstborn of all creation, in whom and through whom all things were created and all things hold together, And when they heard Paul speak about God's eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, being able to be understood and seen through the things God has made, that made all the sense in the world to them. There was no contradiction. Two books. They studied them both. The author of Ecclesiastes has clearly studied the book of creation. For everything, There is a season for everything. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot what is planted. A time to break down and a time to build back up. The author has looked deeply at reality, at natural reality, and sees contrasts that seem to many of us at times like contradictions but are part of the nature of reality. And the author invites us to see that, yes, while nothing is permanent, every season has its purpose and offers its gift, no matter how strange it may seem to our mind. Take a tree, for example. Not the evergreen, that doesn't work as well, but take a tree that's not an evergreen. We can learn from a tree, how a tree is rooted in the ground. There is as much going on beneath the soil as there is visible to the eye. A tree is grounded and spacious. It's reaching up towards the sky, even as it is reaching down into the ground. A tree weathers the storms. A tree goes through seasons, a time when there are full of buds, a time when it is full of leaves, and a time when everything that is beautiful is falling to the ground. A tree experiences being fed by the sun and the water, but it also experiences being fed upon by the creatures of the earth. Gerald May, author of Wisdom of the Wilderness, said that when I watch a tree tree, it helps me be me. When we watch a tree be a tree, it can help us become who we are as people created by God. Getting outdoors puts us in a position where we can read the sacred text of creation, glean its lessons, and the wisest among us try not to superimpose the season that they want upon the season that is. And the wisest among us learn to glean whatever lessons whatever grace, whatever gift there is in the season that we find ourselves in. The wisest among us learn to inhabit fully the season that we are in and to do it even wholeheartedly, which at times feels like a bridge too far. So what is the season that you're in? What is the season that you're in the midst of right now? Are there buds emerging that hold great promise, but they're not fully formed, and you don't know what it's going to become, and you're being invited to practice patience and waiting, and you're being invited to pay attention to the smallest signs of growth. 
Is your tree full of leaves right now? You are feeling and experiencing great abundance, and you're enjoying and savoring that, and you're noticing that other people are feeding upon that abundance, and it's good. Or are you in a season where everything that was once beautiful seems to be falling away? And you're losing leaf after leaf after leaf. And at times you feel crushed by that. It feels like death. And in some ways it is. What season are you in? And what would it look like to resist the temptation to superimpose the season you want for the season that you're experiencing? What would it be like to be present fully, wholeheartedly even? to the season you're in, to get outside if you need to, if you're stuck, and to learn from the lessons all around you, to let Christ speak to you through creation and through the creatures, to remember that you don't have to hold it all together, but there is one who does through every season, holding it all together, holding you together through it all. That's the first step. But here's the second one, which may get a little more uncomfortable for us Presbyterians. I can tell you it was uncomfortable for me as I began to explore some of this. But listen, creation isn't simply the backdrop for your life or mine. It's not just a backdrop offering a helpful metaphor along the way. In the same way we believe that the Bible is not a dead book but a living book, The same way that we we understand that these words that were written years ago through the power of the Holy Spirit and the revelation of Jesus Christ can meet us personally and intimately right now in the midst of what we're going. If you're in circles of trust, that's precisely what you experience in those circles, right? The living word in the same way. The book of creation through the power of the Holy Spirit through the revelation of Jesus, the Christ, the firstborn of all creation, in whom, through whom, all things were created, and who holds it all together, through the power of that, you can be met in an intimate way by God's creation or God's creatures. Meister Eckhart wrote that every single creature is full of God and is a book about God. Every creature is a word of God. St. Augustine preached this sermon where he said, some people, in order to discover God, read books. But there is a great book, The Very Appearance of Created Things. Look above you. Look below you. Read it. God, whom you want to discover, never wrote that book with ink. Instead, God set before your eyes the things that he has made. Can you ask for a louder voice than that? He echoes Job, who says, ask the animals, the birds, the plants, the fish, and they will teach you. Have you ever sat at the foot of a bird or a fish and became a student of what they might offer you? Or the psalmist who says, even though heaven and earth use no words and no sound is heard from them, yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the end of the world. So it's not just a loud voice, though. As Song of Solomon invites us to see, it's a loving voice. As the author shares his experience of God's love through the presence of a gazelle, we want to get rid of them, right, in our yard. We get rid of those deer. Right? The Song of Solomon experiences love through that presence, through the presence of a dove. Look, listen, there's my lover. Do you see him coming? My lover has arrived, and he's speaking to me. There's a whole lot of deer showing up in Bergen County. Could it be that God is speaking to us through them? If you think this is new, this has been echoed through some of the great spiritual teachers. St. Francis of Assisi speaks of sister moon and brother sun, kinship with the sun and the moon. Pope Francis, named after St. Francis, spoke recently of the entire material universe, soil, water, mountains, as the caress of God. Thomas Aquinas 
and Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, you can't get two people further away theologically, both talk of a God who penetrates us through creation. They have came to the same place. Isn't that amazing? People of faith, like the author of the Song of Solomon, have experienced God's love in a personal, intimate way, like the presence of a friend, even a lover. They've experienced God's presence wooing them in the most unexpected ways. They've experienced God's mysterious timing, having been met, even penetrated in the moment by the grace of God. Have you had an experience like that in your life? I've heard many of you share those with me. I don't understand this. I do not pretend to understand this. But I've experienced it too many times and I've heard too many stories. Not to trust it. Creation is not just the backdrop for our life. That's the height of arrogance to think this is all here just to please us. God is loving us, yes, through and through it all. But God's grace permeates all of it. I've experienced Christ through a companion hawk who showed up over many years as I was going through some significant discerning in my life, the hawk was there to remind me again and again that I wasn't alone and I wasn't separate. I've experienced that recently in my friend, the heron, who was helping me live into this season of my life and to discover the gifts that I will need for this season. I've experienced a tree in a moment of profound grief, grieving with me. A companion in the most intimate moment where I was letting go of all this pain. That tree was a friend for me. And I'll always treasure the grasshopper. Without the grasshopper, I know that I wouldn't be standing here as your pastor, and I definitely wouldn't be standing here on a lawn in front of a garden preaching to tomatoes as well as human beings. I know that with all my heart. As I've shared in other sermons, I won't repeat it, I was very reticent about being being the pastor and stepping into that role, kind of coming out of the shadows and being target practice for people. That's kind of how I looked at it, right? I was reticent, and yet I was being drawn. I felt drawn into that. And I'll never forget, I was sitting in my office. I was the associate pastor at the time. I received an email from the Center for Action and Contemplation about a new school, the living school, that was going to be focused on Christian mysticism and led by Father Richard Rohr, a Franciscan priest who had spoke to me and helped me pull some things together in my own life and my own theology, and my heart leapt when I read that email. I said, I want to do that. I want to do that. It was particularly timely because I had wanted to see Richard Rohr in person, and even though he had come in Bergen County many times, I'd never had the opportunity, so I said, i got to do this. But it was a busy time in my life, and I needed one more thing, like I needed a hole in the head. So I said, God, I need to know that you're in this, because if it's just the ego, I don't want to do it, because I don't have the time to do this. And so I decided to make an appointment at the community of St. John the Baptist in Mendham, New Jersey, and I said, I'm going to go on a retreat this summer, it was about a month or two in the, in the future, I said, and I'm going to spend time with this question and, uh, and others. And so I did. I set apart this time to be outdoors, to walk and to pray and to journal. And so I did. And that first morning, I was walking around. And I walked by, I literally, it was a garden like this on their campus. And the sign on the garden was the Garden of Hope. And there was a grasshopper on the sign. I thought that was kind of curious. And I kept walking. I went into the woods. A couple hours passed, you know, still praying. It was a gorgeous day, but in the woods there was a lot of shade. And every now and then the sun would peek through. And So I'm walking. And all of a sudden this thing just darts across the path. Kind of took me by surprise. And it landed on a leaf in front of me. And the sun just somehow peered through the trees just enough. So it was almost like there was a spotlight on this little insect. And when I looked closer, it was a grasshopper. And I said, I didn't know grasshoppers could fly. So I found that curious. So I sat down. And I just said, Lord, what do you want me to see here? 
what do you want me to see? What am I missing? I didn't get an answer. So I kept walking, and Community of St. John the Baptist is one of the retreat centers where they actually have Wi-Fi. So when I got back to the room, I went on, you know, Google or something and tried to learn a little bit more about a grasshopper. And sure, I found out that they do fly. They could only fly forward. They can't go backwards. And in some traditions, they believe when the grasshopper shows upon, up on your path, you should move forward quickly and trust your hunch. So that's what I did. I moved forward quickly. And by the end of those two days, I had written 21, responded to 21 questions that were part of the application. It just flowed out of me. These were hard, like intimate questions about my walk with God. And I became accepted as a student in that living school. And it was a game changer. It was a game changer. Without that school where we were taught to to say yes to life as it is, to practice living contemplatively. Without the people that surrounded me during that time, without these people that were inspiring from all walks of life, living deeply the Christian path that they were called, without them I know that I would have never said yes to the opportunity to be your pastor. But somehow that program helped open my heart, open my mind, open my spirit to the living God to the living God. Fast forward three years at the end of the program, day after graduation. They didn't use the word graduation because we never graduate. Never. They used the word sending. We were sent back into our life, into our roles, whatever they might be. We were sent out. And so two buddies and me, we were hiking the Sandia Mountains the next day. And we reached the pinnacle. We looked down on the valley and we were just thanking God for each other, for the journey that we'd been on. And we were in a little triangle. And my buddy from New Zealand said, whoa, there's a grasshopper. And I risked sharing the story with them. And we just stood there in awe at the mystery, the mystery of God's love and the hand of grace upon us, and we gave thanks to God, overwhelmed by the love of Christ. For everything, there is a season, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot what's been planted, a time to tear down and a time to build up again. Get up, dear friend, fair and beautiful lover. Come To me, leave your seclusion, leave your separation, and come to be with me in the open. Come. What season are you in in your life? And what would it look like to say yes? Yes to the season you're in. Yes to the love that meets you where you are. Yes to the one who calls you out of your separateness into a deeper connection with all that is. Amen.